So this afternoon, I'm going to share with you a, a few cases. Um, I'm going to combine my, I'm supposed to have two cases, so I'm just combining into one talk. I think it's simpler. Um, I think, you know, many of us always talk about, discuss, think about, you know, a patient should have bypass surgery or they should have PCI. But I think in reality, as, uh, as uh, Steve's case, and I will illustrate a couple cases, many patients need both, whether it's very short time next to each other or kind of long term down the road. So almost, I think, you know, we have to start thinking about it as sort of complementary to each other. And I want to use a couple cases maybe to illustrate that. So that's just the um, conflict of interest. So traditionally, um, after bypass, we don't think about uh, PCI too often, but typically we know after traditional bypass surgery, there's acute uh, vein closure, even though our surgical colleagues said that never happens. Um, but you know that if you do angiography on many of them right away, a fair number of patients will have uh, vein closures and sometimes lima anastomosis, suture stenosis as well. So typically we deal with that with angioplasty. And often, you know, again, radio artery um, graft failure is not uncommon, uh, typically after bypass surgery. So I want to show a couple of things that, that is kind of a little different is that, you know, a lot of times we, the surgeons always say they can revascularize all the territories at, of question. And I want to show a case of that. That may not be the case. And even looking back, they might not be able to do it. Um, again, there's also, you know, progression of native uh, vessel disease. We always thought that can happen over time, a long time, but it sometimes can happen very quickly as well. So the first patient is a 64-year-old men with hypertension, diabetes, and elevated LP little a. So he had an outside PCI in right coronary in 2003 and subsequently directly referred to our surgeons for bypass surgery for diffuse um, LED disease, a circumflex disease, and a total right. So he got a lemur to the LED, a SVG to the right coronary, as well as graft uh, to the uh, circumflex as well. This was in October 2016. But he never got better afterwards. And then typically, you know, in sometimes in outside clinic or internal medicine clinic, they thought, you know, after bypass, everything is just okay. So this is probably not angina. But the poor guy continued to have exertional left arm pain that if you talk to him first time, you say, this is angina. But because it's post, -bi post bypass, many times it's written off as, you know, musculoskeletal. It is something that uh, to do with the surgery itself. So eventually, they did a positive nuclear stress, which uh, the nuclear test, which shows that basically have a moderate to large reversible ischemia in the lateral wall. This was now in April. So he has basically angina after bypass for about six months. So I want to show you the original uh, angiogram before bypass. So you can see from the left injection, um, it's, it's really short left main, so the LED is not well seen, but you can see that there's sort of a diffuse disease in the LED. The circumflex also has diffuse disease as well, and there's a couple of large um, obtuse marginal branch, I'll show that again uh, in a different view, as well as the collateral to um, totally occluded right. Um, a separate view, this is the caudal view. Um, you can see the LED as uh, sort of flashing in, um, but take it, so I don't want to show too many part of this angiogram, there's a diffuse disease in the LED. But the circumflex has a pretty tight lesion before the bifurcation of two um, sort of major uh, OMs, uh, a bifurcating OM. Um, and it is a little difficult to tell whether there's a stenosis in the top branch in here, for example. But there's clearly a lesion before and maybe a lesion there. Another view of the circumflex. So this particular diabetic patient has a problem as well that there's distal lesion in this location. So because of the LED lesion, right, total right, the circumflex lesions, he was sent for bypass. What do you think his syntax was? Um, because of the CTO, probably in the high 20s, if not, uh, you know, um, because of the diffuse LED multiple segment, you can count them different ways. So, so yeah, because of the uh, CT of the right as well. So this is the angiogram after he came back to, uh, to see us because of the uh, angina. So this is the native injection. So you can see the circumflex artery, the top branch is now sort of um, not really showing up too much. You can still see the stenosis barely. Um, the lower part, this vessel still opens. Question is whether there's a graft going into it Obviously, the surgeons on a surgical um, discharge uh, said that they bypassed a lateral vessel. They didn't really say which vessel. 
and next go next one. So this is the radio um, to the OM2. Um, so this is the um, six months after the initial bypass, clearly sort of um, diffusely not really opening up that well, maybe because it is a radio, maybe also it hooks up to a pretty small vessel, so it never really grew um, to any, any significant degree. And also maybe, again, because of the, all the proximal uh, circumflex lesion, there's no retrograde filling either, so it doesn't really feed a whole lot of territory except that spot. So it, it makes sense a bit in the sense that the circumflex is kind of not really well revascularized. Um, so the right has this um, vein graft to the PDA, which looks okay. So the question is that can, if you look backwards on the original angiogram, the surgeons couldn't really do very much because that top vessel has a lot of disease. The bottom vessel is kind of small. So in retrospect, that vessel probably is better off to be treated interventionally because we could do more things than what the surgeons can do. So that's kind of what we aim to do, is to try to reestablish blood flow as much as we can in those branching uh, OMs. But the idea, again, there's a lot of diffuse disease distally as well. We may not be able to you know, treat, for example, these type of stenosis. But the idea is trying to fix this area and this area and the proximal uh, spot as well. So there's two wires down the OM. So one thought early is that how disease is this particular branch on the top? I'm sorry, Mike pointer here, um, that do we need to treat this as a bifurcation uh, on the, these two branches? Because if it is not too tight, maybe by fixing the uh, one vessel, what, sort of the lesion into the second OM here, and then the, the filling would basically take care of that. Now, typically, I don't care about those vessels as much. Um, obviously, his ischemia is sort of infralateral wall. So we were aiming, again, there's enough work to do to, to sort of hopefully aim for just those two. So we, what we did is that we balloon, obviously, these uh, spots, and we did perform intravascular ultrasound to both vessels. And it really shows us that uh, there is a bifurcation lesion as well as stenosis in both branches. So that's kind of what we did at the end, is do a bifurcation um, to both um, the OMs and also to the um, a little extent to this original lesion down below, but not these branches because it's obviously too small to uh, treat at that time. You can barely see the ghosting in of that um, sort of radiograph. So we have the idea that probably we don't need the radiograph anymore after we fix all this uh, lesion. I'll show you a different view of this, I think. So it looks pretty good in terms of uh, basically um, treating both branches. So. I think just to illustrate sometimes, even if you want to do, do it again, the surgeons in some certain anatomy, we can actually play a bigger role in that particular vessel than the surg our surgical colleague. Um, another patient, so 48-year-old um, patient with hypertension, um, coronary artery disease, unstable angina. Um, September of last year, have lima, rima to, um, lima to the LED, a rima to the ramus, and a seventh vein graft to an OMPDA. Um, was uh, on ticagrelor, um, this again sent directly to the surgeons and post-operatively because of bleeding, he has been taken back to the OR for a washout. Again, had persistent and significant angina afterwards, so uh, waiting for a few months and came back to the cath lab. So this is the pre-bypass uh, angiogram, um, pretty ugly disease. Um, you have a left main that's quite long and you have sort of a bifurcation lesion, trifurcation lesion involving both the LAD, the circumflex, and hiding behind it as either a ramus or it looks like a high OM. A lot of disease in the LAD as well. So um, you can see that uh, this is the OM, um, high OM, or could be called sort of intermediate um, in this disease in the uh, LAD as well. So I think this, uh, if you look at it initially, young man, um, likely, I think, that, again, the syntax score I haven't shown the right side yet um, is relatively high because if you count it as a ramus, um, left main disease, uh, as, uh, and also diffuse LAD disease as well. So the right has a, a couple of lesions. There's a proximal lesion as well, a mid lesion, and maybe some diffuse disease down below in the PLs in that region. So um, just to show you um, kind of diffuse disease in the, in the OM. 
So came back for his um, angiogram six months later because of uh, you know persistent uh, angina. The, the first thing that struck this is done by my colleague, and it looks like the vessels are smaller, even though the, the magnification looks about the same. The left main looks like there's some diffuse either uh, you know progression or spasm, and you barely can see uh, sort of the LED has some competitive flow from the uh, lima. See some retrograde filling of some of these vessels of the bypass. And the right is the sort of more dramatic, um, you know, remember the original lesion was just really in the proximal top here. And there's really a quite significant uh, progression in that vessel. This is only six months after the bypass surgery. And this was taken with some nitro already, so it's not spasm. There's really no, why would it have a spasm sort of that far down the right corner, not from the catheter or anything like that. A different view. So again, um, quite tight, and you don't really see the distal vessel filling in that well. The lima is to the LED. Again, diffuse disease, but looks patent. This is the rima to the um, sort of the, up the lateral wall vessel. Again, it looks like there's some narrowing in the distal area as well. It was tapering down pretty quickly. It's quite interesting is whether you know, his pericardial bleeding um, or after his initial surgery, does it sort of create a more inflammatory response that leads to all this sort of diffuse narrowing of the vessel? Can that be one of the possibility? If you look at this um, graph to the OM, is again, terrible. But the story um, continues a little bit that actually, you know, again, sometimes doing PCI is not so simple either. So this is, again, my colleague putting some stents down. And what happened is that uh, when they balloon it first and after a few dilation, they dissected it. Because by injecting um, with maybe a balloon there, they obviously now created a bigger problem. But we can fix that, obviously, because the wire is down there and just serial, you know, long stenting. But again, now you have sort of the flow problem because at the end you have probably a, a hematoma around the right coronary distally. So these issues, uh, when there's a lot of infl inflammation going around the vessel, whether it's progression native atherosclerosis or pericardial inflammation um, during PCI um, is also problematic. For example, we've done PCI like this uh, with this very simple CTO. The, the surgeon didn't, didn't, didn't uh, really sort of bypassed and the vessel perforate a small little branch and create hematoma that is very difficult to treat. Uh, you cannot tap it because it's in the wall of the, of the RV itself. So post bypass, you really have to be very careful in terms of what you do. So this is, again, my, my colleague putting some stents and he decided not to stent the, some of the distal area because he felt that there was you know, um, hematoma around it and wait for it to come back. And so this story of this gentleman is not finished. He's going to come back again in a little bit and take a look at all the other vessels and see whether they are uh, any better. So I think what I want to talk a little bit more about is this you know, issue. The, those two cases are obviously urgent, meaning they have continued uh, uh, issue of... Uh, of uh, um, angina. So there's uh, some of us, or the surgeons as well, thinking about, well, you know, some of these more difficult um, lesions, maybe we can simplify by doing a sort of stage PCI after bypass surgery. So lima to the LED, because most of the benefit, as you know, from bypass surgery is really the internal memory artery to the LED. So perform it either using a robot or using minimally invasive methodology, and the same hospitalization, PCI to other lesions. And basically, you can have benefits of the lima and a complete revascularization by DES. So the NIH is actually sponsoring a trial. Um, it's called Hybrid, which is essentially a randomized trial of hybrid coronary revascularization um, versus PCI. Again, trying to pick out patients that could be obviously uh, treated in this fashion and excluded some of the CTOs in the territory that obviously cannot be done easily. Um, this is being sort of a, a little bit uh, delayed because um, you know in here you can also treat left main, and right now there's no stents or no DES that has the indication for left main. So, um, so this trial is being delayed a little bit. So just to show a case that we have done um, in pretty straightforward, but just sort of illustrates what we this what what we means and what problem it can create. So 64 year old guy has a non-STEMI. 
um, and wanted to avoid traditional surgery because of amyloidosis and bleeding. And so he had a robotically assisted lemur to the LED and PCI to PDA, PL, and circumflex. Um, hopefully this can play. Um, unfortunately, uh, these are films from outside, so it's a little dark. And um, again, the you can see there's some complex LED lesion, but doesn't necessarily mean that we cannot uh, do PCI, but this was again sent to our surgeons. and. So I felt that they should uh, go ahead and have a lima to the LED and do this hybrid approach. But if it's originally sent to us, it could certainly be a case for either FAME 3, which is you know, PCI, um, FFR guided PCI, or could be surgical. But uh, our surgeons want to try to see whether they can just do a robotic assisted um, lima to the LED followed by um, for us to do uh, the rest of the lesion. So again, the circumflex, um, it looks like a subtotal area this time, but maybe because of the non-STEMI. And the right coronary also has some lesion distally, so not that complex, complicated uh, PCI. Um, I'm gonna go ahead with um, post-bypass. So this is a day after bypass surgery. And you can see the chest tubes are still in. One problem of doing an early PCI after bypass is that we see these kind of haziness around the lima, and you don't know what it means. Is there some narrowing? There's a bit of um, whether it's some edema around it, and certainly, um, if the, the difficulty is that, what do we do? Do we go and fix it, or dilate it, or, or do nothing? So at this point, you know, one day after a, a bypass surgery without any clinical problems, it's hard to gonna go ahead and do. So basically, that's one issue: is what do we do when we see lima issues? Do we actually leave it alone or do something? So this hybrid. Uh, protocol, I think, has to address that type of a problem. So the right corner has that lesion, relatively straightforward. So that is what's done. So it's just a simple stent. We look at this, the diagonal. Remember, the diagonal has this complex lesion there as well. So we took care of that as well. This, remember the circumflex was totally occluded, but now it's actually opened. So this was the original thrombotic non stemi in Europe that now spontaneously recanalized, obviously make the case easier for us to fix. So we fixed the circumflex. Looks pretty good. And we finally fixed the diagonal as well. So essentially we did more work than the surgeons. We did all the diagonal, we did the circ, we did the right, and we check out his lima as well. So that's kind of the hybrid for this particular patient. The problem is that you know what we think is seems to be a pretty good idea, but there's some pitfalls that we have done a few of these cases, not in the protocol. Is again these uh, lima and estomosis anomalies. Is what do you do? Do you leave alone or not? And if you have these complicated lesions in the left alone for us to do in the uh, non-LED territory, when should we do that? Because you know, if you have um, any perforation or little wire perforation, and most of the time when it is a routine non-bypass patient, it's pretty simple to fix. But in this kind of patient, they could cause life-threatening problems because if you bled, it would not cause pericardial fusion, it would cause a hematoma in the uh, muscle itself and some, it's almost impossible to treat it by us. And surgeons have a hard time because essentially blood is intermingled with the myocytes. So again, this can be, make us very, uh, you know, worry about going in very early um, as we discussed. And so again, um, really what should we look at? And how should we approach this? Whether it's suitable for many patients or selected out like the first patient we had, maybe that's good a hybrid case because that circumflex is very difficult to revascularize. So maybe a subset of patient could be done in this hybrid fashion. So it's just some cases for, for thoughts. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.